welcome back to Wine Bob. Thanks for joining us. I'm really excited today because we're going to be tasting from what I would argue is one of the most iconic portfolios in American history. And I say American history because these wines, or at least the family behind these wines, uh, dates back to pre-prohibition and continues into present day. And But before I go too much into story time on these wines, I want to go ahead and break down the tasting experience itself and, and what exactly tasting is. There's a bit of a difference between drinking and tasting. We all know how to drink, uh, and some of us are, are really good at it. Uh, but tasting is a much more thoughtful experience. It starts with what you see, it, it continues on to what you're smelling, then to tasting, and then ultimately, ideally, will end up in your stomach. Uh, but what we need to remember is that 60% of what you're tasting is what you're smelling. So it's really important to kind of break down and be really thoughtful about what is happening when you're actually smelling these wines because if you can pinpoint what flavors you're going to be experiencing, then when you're tasting it, it really kind of heightens the experience of, uh, you know, from glass to glass. And I'm really excited with these wines because I think it gives you a really good uh, understanding of what we can expect out of um, a, a difference in price range. We've got the Barefoot California Chardonnay, uh, which is, I believe I got this for about $4 a bottle. Uh, the Gallo Cabernet Sauvignon, which is at around $4 as well. We have the Cali Hart uh, Talbot Vineyards Chardonnay. Uh, which was just under 20, I believe it was at $17.99. And then the Louis Martini uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from Sonoma Coast, this is from 2015, and I believe this as well was about $18.99. Um, so we've got a really nice spread in terms of price points here, and we are gonna be doing a lower end Chardonnay with a higher end Chardonnay, lower end cab with a higher end cab. Um, and I've got kind of a difference in glassware here, I'm sure you recognize. Um, and so I, I actually have had people come up to me and ask me, you know, why such ridiculously large glasses? Well, you know, I'm sure you've heard the thing about guys with big feet, they wear big shoes. I've got big glasses because I've got big wines in them. Uh, so going into this tasting, a larger bowl is going to help aerate the wine, open it up a little bit faster. Also, this bigger bowl with the narrower tip at the front is going to trap some more of those aromas inside the bowl. Um, and just like we talked about in one of the earlier videos, uh, these rounder bowl types are designated for these more aromatic varietals like Chardonnay or Pinot Noir, um, something where the aromatics of that wine are going to lend much more deeply into that experience. Uh, so before we go before I sidetrack too much, I really want to break down the different types of aromas and the different types of, of flavors that you can experience inside these glasses. Um, and first is going to be uh, fruit aromas. You, and I'd say this is probably one of the smallest categories, are, uh, funny enough, but in white wines, you're going to be experiencing things like um, citrus fruits, tropical fruits, uh, even tree fruits like apples and pears. You could also get pitted fruits like peaches and nectarines. Um, and then in red wines, you'll be getting red fruits like raspberries, cherries, uh, red plums, things of that sort. Black fruits like blackberries, uh, blue fruits like blueberries. Um, but again, it's just whatever whatever you smell and whatever you taste, it's these words that you can use to best describe your experience. Um, I'm, I will be putting uh, in the comment section a link to the Master Psalm um, resources page, which actually has a, a tasting language chart where it, it kind of breaks down all these different words that you can use to describe a lot of these different smells and tastes that you'll be experiencing. And the benefit of that is, uh, like I said, the tasting experience starts with what you're seeing. So if I look at my first glass and I say, okay, it's a white wine. Well, what I just said was the types of fruits that I can experience from this glass are most likely going to be things like tree fruits. Um, I could possibly get some pitted fruits. I could possibly be getting some citrus fruits. I could possibly be getting um, uh, tropical fruits as well. So if I keep those ideas in my head, um, and the best way to think about this is you've had an apple before. You know what an apple tastes like. You know what an apple smells like. And 
there is there is a certain part of your memory that is associated to the things that you smell and the things that you taste. So try and lock that memory in your brain so that when you jump into this glass, you can start to smell whether or not it triggers those sorts of uh, aroma and tasting memories. Um, but you just, you know, start slow. And that's why I'm going to start with the barefoot is that this isn't an overly complex wine. It's not going to be bombarding your senses with a lot of different things. Um, California Chardonnay can tend to be a little on the vanilla or sorry, vanilla e oakier, buttery side with some slightly ripe fruit characteristics. But again, this isn't a super complex um, style of wine. So just start simple. If you, if I tell you right there that you can experience this vanilla um, aroma or vanilla flavor, then try to think of what vanilla smells like. Try to think about what vanilla tastes like. And then when you go into the glass, smell it. And do you smell vanilla? Um, to a certain extent, tasting is a very subjective exercise. So if I am tasting with you and we're tasting the same wine and I ask you what you're tasting, um, I'm probably not going to tell you, oh, you should be tasting vanilla or, oh, you should be tasting apple. Um, I'd be more guiding you into things like, you know, what types of fruits are you experiencing? That way you can put your own words to your own sensations. I can't tell you what your experience is going to be like. Um, all I can do is help guide you in that direction. Um, so to kind of break down the different categories of, of aromas, you've got fruit characteristics, which we just kind of described a little bit. We've got non-fruit characteristics, which are going to be things like floral aromas, vegetal, herbal aromas, spices, earthiness. Um, and you've got two different types of earth. You've got organic earth, which will be things like uh, soil. And then you've got things like inorganic or earth, which would be more like mineral or rocks or like crushed earth or, you know, any like dustiness. All those are inorganic earthy compounds. Um, and then one of the last ones is oak. And oak can present itself in a number of different ways. The most common ways that you'll experience in wine are going to be things like uh, caramel, vanilla, uh, baking spices like nutmeg or cinnamon, star anise, uh, even clove. Um, and so that's another thing to think about when you're jumping into a glass of wine as well, is do I experience these spicy characteristics? Do I experience these vanilla caramely characteristics? Because um, if you do, then that means that that wine probably experienced some sort of wood or oak contact. Um, and the nice thing and the interesting thing about oak uh, is that the winemaker can control to a certain extent what types of experiences you're going to be having from that oak. They can toast it a certain degree to give you vanilla, or they can toast it even more to give you coffee or chocolate. Um, so a lot of what you're experiencing in this glass is very intentional. Um, Winemaking is an art uh, as well as a science, and so we really have to the, the reason why tasting is important is it gives us an opportunity to see what the winemaker wants us to see, but experience it for ourselves through that subjective lens. Um, so then after we're going through all of these, these different um, um, uh, notes or, or the different aromas and whatnot, uh, there's also the structure. And we talked about that in an earlier video. Uh, the four components of structure are going to be tannin, acid, alcohol, and sugar. Um, so is your wine really tannic? Is it, is it have that mouth drying sensation? Does it give you that textural component on the palate? Uh, the acid, does it have a vibrancy about it? Does it make you salivate on the sides of your tongue? Uh, alcohol, does it give you that burning sensation in the chest or in the throat? Um, and then sugar, does it have this residual sweetness to it? Um, a wine that does not have any any residual sugar to it um, is referred to as dry. Um, so when you hear people say, oh, I like dry red or oh, I like dry whites, what they're saying is they like wines that are not sweet. Um, but then there is obviously that scale where you can go into lusciously sweet or off dry where it's just a little bit sweet. Um, all of these wines today should be dry for the most part. So you don't have to worry too much about the sugar part of it. But just to give you the tools in terms of the language that we're going to be using moving forward. That way when I say, oh, we're drinking a dry wine or oh, this is a lusciously sweet wine you know what I'm talking about. And the more wines we taste together, the more that I'll be able to describe to you what I'm experiencing, and you'll be able to translate that into what you can expect in this glass. Um, so first, just to kind of 
take that uh, experience into the first one just to kind of give you an example of how this all works. Ooh, I get a lot of these really ripe fruits, a little bit of uh, mainly tropical fruits. I get things like banana, fairly ripe pineapple, even a little bit of mango or passion fruit. I get some vanilla in there, not a whole lot of baking spice to it. Um, but so I think there was some sort of wood contact and knowing um, the price point on this wine, I would argue that maybe they just threw some wood chips in there or something like that, just to give it a little bit of that um, oak sensation. I don't think they actually used an oak barrel because oak barrels are very expensive. Uh, we're talking well over $1,000 just for one barrel to make wine. So on a $4 bottle of wine, you're probably not going to be getting um, an oak barrel treatment. But in any case, I do get a lot of these really ripe uh, fruit characteristics. I do get a little bit of uh, this oak contact, which is giving me this vanilla characteristic to it. Oof, man, now the vanilla is really just filling the glass. Um, which kind of gives it this sweetness on the nose. There's this sweet cream butter that I'm kind of getting on the nose. Um, it looks like, oh, uh, that, that's one thing that I hadn't quite gotten into yet is the legs, the tears um, on the glass. If you hear somebody talking about, oh, look at the legs on this glass. Oh, this is such a beautiful wine. For the most part, that's bullshit. Um, there's not a whole lot that legs on wine is going to tell you other than the fact that there's a viscosity to the wine. And in these wines, usually viscosity is going to translate uh, to either glycerol um, or sugar of, of some sort or you know, alcohol. Um, and so that's really all the legs are going to tell you. It's going to give you some sense of the viscosity of that wine and give you some sense of the extraction of that wine. but. It's not gonna tell you a whole lot about what the experience is gonna be on your palate other than the fact that it might be a more viscous style. Um, and just to kind of illustrate that, use the big glass so you can kind of see it, uh, the tears are these little lines that you'll see going down the edge of the glass. I don't know if you can see that, um, the lighting's a little rough, but um, yeah, that's the legs right there. Really just a measure of of alcohol, just a measure of that residual sugar viscosity. But other than that, it really doesn't tell you a whole lot. Um, so don't let anybody tell you that you're drinking a beautiful wine because it's got legs. There's a number of other reasons why you're drinking a beautiful wine. Um, but part, you know, for the most part, it starts with your subjective opinion on that wine. So like I said, I'm getting tropical fruits on this wine. I'm getting um, this vanilla characteristic. It kind of has this lusciousness to it, which I'm not really surprised about. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and take a sip of it. So I don't get a lot of spice. I don't get a lot of earthiness. Um, like I said, I get a little of that oakiness. I don't really get any floral components, not anything vegetal. Really, it's just that oak vanilla characteristic in that fruit which i'm not surprised by like this is uh this is kind of a not really a two buck chuck but it's a four dollar bottle of wine it's meant to be easily drinkable um and wines like that they do add just a touch of residual sugar to it which heightens the lushness of the fruit like we were talking about last week i um, mean the benefit of doing that for these drinkable wines is they're tasty um you know it tastes like really fresh vibrant juicy fruits um, but when, you know, white wines in general aren't going to have tannins, so you don't need to worry about really kind of isolating tannin components on this, but you talk about the acid on a wine like this, and there's not enough acid to really bounce, balance out that slight sugary, um, component. It's not sweet by any stretch of the imagination. It just adds that lusciousness to it. Um, but it seems a little flabby. <clears throat> this is an easy drinking wine, but without that acid to balance it out, it just kind of sits floppy on your palate. Um, and you'll see that when we get into these other wines where they've got more acid to act as a backbone on that wine, um, they can balance out the characteristics in such a way that they stand up straight. Um, and they, they, everything just kind of acts with a certain degree of prominence. Um, so anyway, moving forward, um, before I go too much into these other wines, I kind of want to break down the stories of these wines. 
Um, since we started tasting the Barefoot wine, uh, Barefoot was found back in 1965 by uh, Davis Bynum. And the name Barefoot comes from the fact that he started this winery inside of his garage and he would use foot stomping to, to crush the grapes and, and get the juice from them. Uh, so it wasn't just a clever name, it was actually based on the way that he was making his wines at the time. Um, he had a relatively fast expansion. They became wildly prop popular and it was, uh, it was in, I think, it was in the 2000s when they got acquired by Gallo, um, but their new winemaker, Jennifer Wall, um, has been making wine since I think 2013 and she is an award-winning winemaker. I think she's got something like 2,000 different um, awards for the wines that she makes. Um, so there are some very talented hands that go into making the wines at Barefoot, but they're focused a little bit more on like this, um, not really party experience, but they are much more fun loving uh, style of winemakers. So you do have the Barefoot line which covers Chardonnay, I believe they've got Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, um, Pinot Gris, but then they've also got Barefoot Bubblies, um, which are sparkling wines that they make as well. And then uh, recently they started making Barefoot Spritzers, um, which is almost like a wine spritzer that um, I think they just launched this year. So it's a relatively new project that they're doing, but again, they're focused less on making luxury style wines, that have like this really intricate pedicure toward them and they're focused a little bit more on kind of this fun loving style of wine. Um, and it shows in this, in this wine a lot. It's not an unpleasant wine, it definitely has its place, um, but I would argue that every wine has its place, it's just what you're gonna do with that wine. Uh, so that's the Barefoot. So moving on to the Gallo. Uh, Gallo was founded by, <clears throat> by Ernesto and, and Julio Gallo back in uh, 1933, uh, which was just in the late stages of Prohibition. Um, the reason why that's actually kind of an interesting thing was a lot, during that time, the only winemakers on the scene were a lot of bulk wine producers. Um, and Gallo came on the scene and they were kind of the small guy on the field. They invested maybe $10,000 in opening a location. Um, their first location was founded in Modesto. Um, and actually that's where their main winery is today. It's still in Modesto. Um, but they turned out something like 177,000 gallons of wine in their first year. And by their second year, they were turning out almost 450,000 gallons of wine. So that just gives you an idea of how fast they grew, how quickly they expanded. Um, and they spent the next 30 years essentially making a name for themselves. They were the first to pioneer um, TV marketing for wine. Um, they were the first ones in the 60s to do um, long-standing um, contracts with their growers, which was essentially a way of them saying, hey, you know, if you grow Cabernet Sauvignon, I'll pay you for Cabernet Sauvignon, um, which was very new to the industry at the time, but they pretty much pioneered that practice at the time. Um, to date, they have about, well, as of last year, they had 20% market share, or just over 20% market share in the entire of the United States. Um, and starting at the beginning of this year, they just sealed a deal with Constellation Brands, which Constellation is another huge brand of wine, um, but Gallo acquired them for $1.3 billion dollars which should bring their market share to just under 30%. So they are a vast, vast network, network of wineries. Um, and it kind of snowballed in the early 2000s. Um, in, in 2002, they acquired Louis Martini. They also acquired Mirasso. 2004, they did Bridalwood. Uh, Barefoot was in 2005. Um, then uh, 2007, Ernest Gallo passed away, unfortunately. Um, but they kept acquiring properties all the way until the present day. And it just kind of snowballed um, with them co purchasing Columbia in 2013, Talbot in 2015. Um, and that's pretty much been what they've been doing ever since, is just buying a lot of these boutique wineries um, to kind of break into different niches of the wine industry because I, I would argue that boutique wineries are really growing at, at a crazy rate, especially here in California. Um, again, 
something I may not have mentioned before is that California is responsible for, uh, I think it's 90% of all wine production in the United States. Um, so we've been pumping out a ton of wine for one. A majority of it is this bulk wine from, from Gallo, um, but we've had a very large growth on the boutique side of it, where places like Louis Martini um, and Talbot have been making beautiful wines for the last, well, uh, Talbot for the last 40 years. Uh, Louis Martini has been making it about just as long as Gallo has, um, but we'll get into them in just a second. Uh, so with Talbot, Talbot's been making wine since about the early to mid 80s uh, when Rob Talbot opened up his first winery in Sleepy Hollow. They own two different estates. They've got the Sleepy Hollow estate and then they've got a Diamond Tea estate. Um, but their focus has always been on wine made in a Burgundian style, which is why for the most part, the only two styles of wine they, they're producing are gonna be made from Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, so we're tasting one of their Chardonnays. This is the Cali Hart Chardonnay. Um, but again, they only really operate out of those two estates. Um, but they still make beautiful wine, and, and I think it was a wonderful addition to the Gallo portfolio. Um, Louis Martini, like I said, just as iconic as Gallo, I would argue that they were equally as influential to, to the marketplace when they were moving along. Um, but Louis Martini was essentially growing and selling grapes during Prohibition. I believe that they were founded back in 1922. Um, but during this period, they're growing grapes and selling them as sacramental wine, which was actually a very common practice during Prohibition. Um, one other thing that was very common during the time that they were practicing as well is selling grape concentrate for home use with a big sign on, on these buckets that would say, don't add yeast or it'll spontaneously start fermentation. Um, which was just a nice funny way of saying, if you want wine, I can't tell you not to do this, so you should do it anyway. Uh, <laughs> and it's how a lot of these wineries ended, ended up surviving, surviving Prohibition. Um, but Louis Martini had since um, been making their wine, like I said, since the, the 30s. They'd gone through three generations of, of Martinis. It started with Louis M. Martini uh, was the founding father and then he passed on to his son Louis P. Martini who passed on to his son Mike Martini and now I believe the current winemaker is Michael Eddy who's been making wine over there since 2013. But they've always been very boutique style. They've always been kind of on the cutting edge. I believe it was in uh, the mid-30s when they started using temperature controlled tanks to do the fermentation which is actually super new at the time um, and it's a very important addition to the wine industry because when you control the temperatures of your fermentation, you can control what types of, of reactions are happening inside your tank. Um, for instance, if you want more tannin from your wine, you would adjust the temperature so that you can focus strictly on tannin extraction from the grapes. But if you wanted to focus more on aromatics, you could do a cooler temperature and focus more on like the pure varietal characteristics of that wine. Um, so again, it was just something super new to the industry that they had never really seen before, but it was, it, it was cutting edge at the time and they were the first ones really to have done it. Um, in 2002, they ended up getting Gallo. They were bought out by Inj Gallo um, and we've been enjoying their wines ever since. So I would like to go ahead and take the opportunity to taste these wines with you. Uh, we went ahead and already did the Barefoot, so I'll jump into the Gallo family Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, I'm not getting a whole lot on the nose with this wine. Um, I do get this sense of like red fruit in general, but nothing super specific. It's just kind of like maybe red apple peel over here or or just like some red berries over there, maybe blackberry, but it's, it's nothing that's like attacking and bombarding my senses. It's a little bit fainter, almost like this caramel um, characteristic to it. So maybe there was some sort of oak um, contact on there, maybe oak chips or oak staves. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump on, on the palate because, like I said, I'm not getting a whole lot on the nose. Yeah, it's like red apple skins, 
Um, and that's kind of it. Um, kind of falls a little bit flat. Kind of falls victim to the same thing this one did where there's this lush fruit characteristic to it. But other than that, it doesn't have a ton of complexity to it. Like I said, there's a place for, for this wine, um, just like there's a place for all wine. Um, but it's not really my style. Uh, it has a little bit of that carameliness to it, but it's not an overly complex. It's a very simple wine. Um, I've always been kind of preferable to white. So between these two wines, um, I prefer the Barefoot um, just because I find it a little bit easier drinking. Um, this is still easy drinking, but I kind of like my reds to have a little bit more muscle and structure to them. Because um, in terms of like the tannin, It's almost lacking in tannin. Um, the tannin's very, very light. It's not aggressive. It doesn't have that that gripping characteristic to it. And then the acid leaves you kind of wanting as well. So it doesn't have the structure behind it to really support a gorgeous Cabernet Sauvignon. And then the fruit itself is just kind of bleh. It, it's kind of just this undistinct red fruit. Um, so, I mean, like I said, there is a place for this wine. Um, but it definitely matches its less than $4 price point. Uh, we're going to move on to the uh, Cali Hart Talbot Chardonnay. I don't know if you can see this. There's like this, this bubbling on the wine there, um, which it, we, we refer to it as effervescence, where it's got this like slight spritziness. It's not carbonated the way like champagne is carbonated, but it does have some sort of gas reaction, which can be intentional. Sometimes it'll lend to that sensation of vibrancy. Um, you know, we were talking about acid lending that vibrancy, but carbonation can do it as well. And when they act together, sometimes it can be very, very, very pretty. Um, on the nose, right off the bat, I'm getting like this flinty minerality, um, almost like river rock being crushed together. It's got like this dustiness to it, which I find very pleasant. Um, this toast, a little bit of sweet cream butter, maybe even like Greek yogurt. Like a peach pit, like, like the woodiness of the peach, a little bit closer to the pitted area, not that fresh juiciness. Um, I get a little bit of this baking spice characteristic, a little bit of vanilla. Cedar box. Almost like this wet foliage. Um, definitely like this organic earth characteristic where it's, it's like, like I said, like this wet foliage or even like potting soil, but with raw vegetation in it that's just kind of uh, gives it a nice little funk to it. I mean, it's pleasant. It's not unpleasant, um, but it definitely has that level of complexity to it that's highlighted a little bit more by its earthiness, which um, with a winery like Talbot that takes a lot of inspiration from old world wines, I'm not, I'm not surprised to see that level of winemaking where they put a little bit more of a focus on what is called terroir. Um, and what terroir is, is it's, it's a sense of place. What they're trying to do is they're trying to give you a sense of the conditions of the vines, of the wines as they were being made. Um, and this definitely does that for me. I almost feel like I'm walking out into the, the vineyard and there's like trampled vegetation off to the side that's just kind of giving this mustiness. I get a sense that maybe there's like this gravelly path leading down the vineyard that just has that like almost like that first rain that drops on it and sets off that that first rain of the season kind of smell on, on your nose. I mean, it's such a pleasant memory to have, but to be able to have that experience as I jump into this glass, it just gets me excited and salivating to find out what this tastes like. Um, whew, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm gonna go ahead and just jump in if you don't mind. Ah, see, that's what Chardonnay should taste like to me. Um, it's like yellow apples, ripe yellow apples. It's got these nice ripe um, pineapples, a little bit of papaya. Um, I almost 
maybe a little bit of banana, but nothing too crazy. Um, nectarine pit. Uh, it also has like mandarin orange in there, like maybe even just like that zest that you get from mandarin orange. Um, and that's kind of the, the fun thing about, about tasting is you, sh you want to be as specific as possible because it really shows that you're kind of focusing in on, on multiple different things that are happening in this glass. And, and higher end wines offer a higher end experience. So down here, we're talking about very simple fruit characteristics where, okay, there's this tropical fruit going on. Um, and maybe there was this oak thing, but I can be very specific about what I'm experiencing in this glass because it's all there. Um, now, one, I just want to backtrack a little bit. These wines are made from 100% grapes, but what's lending these, these profiles into this wine is the chemical reactions that take place during the winemaking process. So the chemicals that are responsible for these aromas and these tastes of, of you know, raw vegetation or, or pineapple or, or apple or what have you, it's not to say that those fruits are in there. All that's saying is that the chemical reaction that took place during the fermentation process created a compound which is very, very um, similar to that other compound. Um, so when you're smelling it, you smell these other fruits even though your experience in here is 100% just grapes. They didn't dump dirt in there to make it taste earthy. Um, these were just byproducts of that winemaking process. It's what the winemaker wants you to experience. Um, and so we'd be doing a disservice to this wine and to the winemaker to just toss it down the hatch um, and not think a second thought about it. Really enjoy the experience of these wines. And, and if you find a wine that blows you away, that you get it, um, share it with somebody if you if you can at all just share it with as many people as you can um, because ultimately these are going to be the experiences that will make or break whether or not you are an avid lover of wine um, sorry I, I tangented a little bit because when you get me going on, on the passion of, of great wine I'll, I'll go all day um, but anyway so I, I really do enjoy this Cali Hart uh, Chardonnay from Talbot. I think at the price point you get a wonderful wine experience and it really does give you a snapshot of what great California Chardonnay can be. Um, so please, if you get a chance to try it, by all means, I, I think you'd really, really enjoy it. I'm going to go ahead and jump over to the Louis Martini. Uh, it's a 2015 Sonoma County uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and one of the things that I enjoy about Sonoma County Cabernet Sauvignon as opposed to Napa Valley um, is a little bit cooler climate, doesn't quite have the ripeness that Napa can bring with it. Um, and I would say that when you have these riper styles of Cabernet Sauvignon, you lose some of the things that make them identifiably Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, for instance, Cabernet can always have this greenness to it um, that I think makes it very, very lovely, uh, when, when it's done correctly, that is. Um, and in Napa, sometimes you get your wine so ripe that you lose some of that greenness. Um, so, you know, if you're tasting it, you wouldn't identify it as Cabernet Sauvignon because it's lost what's made it Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, anyway, I'm just going to go ahead and try this if you don't mind. Whew. So I get like this this dusty chocolate or like dusty coffee, um, really dark, um, roasty kind of characteristic to it. Uh, also these dark fruits like uh, black plum, but slightly dried where or even like on the overripe uh, style of things. Black cherry, uh, cassis or like black currant. slight menthol -y characteristic to it, um, which could be a number of things. Um, but again, it's that greenness, which can be very, fairly common. Ooh, I get this tobacco leaf, which again is that, that herbaceous or that, that greenness that you can get out of Cabernet Sauvignon. Black pepper. Clove spice. So with, with things like coffee and cloves, or, or in this case, like some more of these baking spicing characteristics, uh, this wine most likely has seen no contact. And at, at this price point where it's kind of resting right around $20, um, 
they may they may not be using um, the freshest barrels. Maybe they're using a wine barrel on its you know third or fourth try, but it's still extracting some of those those oaky characteristics. Um, so I, I definitely think this has seen some semblance of oak contact, um, showing a really nice complexity of fruit. Ooh, you get like this this. Um, you know, like Earl Grey tea has that floral component to it. I'm getting a lot of that Earl Grey characteristic to it, that black tea. And that's what I'm talking about. When we were playing around with this Cabernet Sauvignon, first off, I had maybe one or two things I could say about it on the palate because for the most part, it was a fairly simple wine. But what this has that this doesn't have is structure. It has tannin and it has acid and it's got it in spades. So when you drink this, it grips, but it refreshes at the same time. These, th this wine in general gives you an experience that this 100% was lacking. You get that grip, you get that acid, you get that lushness of fruit, that dirty grittiness of like that coffee or chocolate dust. Um, you get that tobacco, you get the baking spices, you get those dark fruits, almost like slightly jammy in character, slightly aged in character. You even get like these dark flowers in there, like violets or something like that, which is almost very pretty and elegant um, on the finish. And that's the other thing about, about these really nice styles of wine is that they will evolve over the course of a night. These wines I don't anticipate are gonna get much better than glass. If I decanted these, these would not get any better. These are meant to be consumed First off, they're meant to be consumed fairly young. Um, within the first year or two of production, you want to be consuming these wines because one, they're not going to age in a way that's going to be beneficial to the way that they taste. Um, but also, that's the way that they were intended to be made. These wines, on the other hand, were meant to be consumed with some semblance of age on it. Um, I'll just pull these off. So, like I said, the Louis Martin was 2015, so this is five years old at this time. Um, and the Talbot Chardonnay is 2016, so this is four years old at this time. Um, so you can already see that these wines can withstand a certain degree of age, and they're only going to get more complex and more interesting as that time goes on. Um, and what that aging will do is, if I've got more of a fresh, vibrant fruit characteristic here, maybe that will start to desiccate a little bit, and so instead of having you know, these fresh black cherries, maybe now I've got like these raisinated cherries. Um, if I've got that tobacco characteristic now, maybe later I'll have like the cedar boxy or even like dusty pencil shavings kind of characteristic going on for it. Um, or, you know, a lot of those secondary and tertiary characteristics that are kind of hanging out on the back um, will start to come to the forefront and that fruit's really going to kind of start to go towards the back and you'll end up with a much more savory style of wine. Um, even with the Chardonnays, um, you see this nice vibrant gold color here. This will start to turn brown, which is normal. Uh, with age, white wines will turn brown and you get this nice purple color on the Cabernet Sauvignon. Well, this will also turn brown. So both these colors will tend to brown. Both of their profiles will tend to this like desiccated type of characteristic, um, but they stay pleasant. And that's what's the most important is that the profiles on these, although they do change and 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 they, they change for the best is what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, maybe the cream on this will turn into cheese or something like that, which kind of sounds a little weird if you've never experienced it before, but this, um, the way that it plays in balance with the wine itself will be a very pleasant experience. Um, and so I look forward to kind of jumping into these wines again, maybe in a year or even in two years, just to kind of see how these profiles play together. But they're only gonna do that if they've got the structure to back them up. Um, so anyway, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know I've, I've kind of rambled on a little bit as it was, but I think this should at least show you that in a large profile like Gallows, you have a pretty good spread of quality versus low quality wines um, that you can still have a very pleasant experience with. 
Um, in any case, I hope you enjoyed today and, and I look forward to sharing more wines with you in the future. Um, we've got some special wines coming next week. We're gonna be doing an old world versus new world tasting where we'll be focusing on um, Kim Crawford Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand and also be focusing on a Sancerre. I can't remember what the producer I pulled was, but I'll go ahead and post them on Instagram and Facebook and, and, and that way at least you'll be able to grab a bottle and, and hopefully share with me. In any case, thank you very much for viewing and uh, hopefully see you and talk to you soon. Cheers. Thank you.